Great. All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to give folks a few moments to join, um, and I'll give a kind of quick intro for today's webinar, as well as how to find our speakers on ASLAP. Um, so my name is Bo. If you haven't been to one of our webinars before, um, I'm the Director of Growth at Ace Lab, and we are helping out partnering today with Radar to be able to provide this AIA-approved course designing flexible interiors with sliding doors and movable walls. Um, so super excited to get started with today's presentation. I'm just going to start with a few quick uh, housekeeping items and a little intro about Ace Lab. Um, so Ace Lab's platform provides free non-sponsored product research. Um, this is a quick snapshot of our team it's designed by architects for architects. So I'm a former architectural designer myself, along with both of our founders, Vardan and Dries. Um, really, we all came at this with the idea that uh, we wanted to save time and allow architects to spend more time designing better buildings and be able to discover uh, building products more easily. So this is kind of a, an example of some of the problems that Ace Labs platform is working to solve. So a lot of these manual tasks or, you know, difficulties finding information, finding products that you've used before and being able to save and store and organize that, as well as researching new products. Um, these were all workflows that we saw could use some help um, in terms of being able to provide one space where it was really easy to do all of this work. So with that, um, I'll take you over to our live site, show you how to find today's speakers on Ace Lab. So once you sign in, you are taken to a custom dashboard view. Um, so you don't have to go to that marketing page again. You kind of get this own personalized dashboard view of all of the work you've been doing on Ace Lab. So whether that's searches that you've done, products that you've saved, conversations with reps directly in the platform, and your own projects, which you can use to kind of save and store and organize all of your information. It's also a great way to uh, stay up to date with all of our upcoming webinars. We'll always have our next webinar uh, displayed right here on your dashboard, so it makes it super easy to register for our next event. So right here in this dark blue bar, we've got all of our searchable product categories. If you're kind of starting from square one and you want to do more of a, um, you know, exploratory search, the, uh, the product advisor tool is a great way to do that. So um, you can basically just go through a quick guided search flow. I'll just kind of go through this quickly to be able to show you how that looks. There's little question marks that will give you some more information about how different filters um, might affect your choices or what those different filters mean. You can put in your project location, project type. So we'll ask you both some project specific and some uh, product specific questions. You can skip any questions that might not be applicable and you can also add in any special requirements. That'll take you to this great page where you get an overview of all of the products that were available. You can save products right from this page. So I can go ahead and save this to my products, to a project, or upload a new project right from this page. And then if you know exactly the manufacturer you're looking for, you can always just use this search bar right at the top. So type in the name of any manufacturer that you're looking for, that'll auto-populate, and you can go right over to their page on Ace Lab. These pages are all organized the same, so it's a really great way to just be able to explore different manufacturers and find all of the information that you need where you uh, expect to find it. You'll get an overview of kind of their main value props, um, a video introducing them, and then you can also save and explore products right in this page as well. So I'm just going to save a few of Radar's products to my general products so that I can show you how that looks. You can also open up one of these product pages. That'll give you some more information, some more images, key highlights, design options, as well as a button to connect with them directly. And if you want to go back and find the products that you've saved, you can go over to your library and go down to your products. Here I've got my uh, short list of products organized by category. I'll open this to compare products here. And here you can see all those Radar products that I just saved are saved here in this handy comparison table format. So I get an overview of all the product information. I can really easily evaluate which of these products might be a good fit for me um, by going down and seeing all the different finish options, performance data, certifications, and even download resources right from this page as well. Um, and then you can also use this to request information. So if you want to reach out to Radar, you can request information super easily nest that under a project. Everybody has a general research product project automatically, so you can use that if you're not looking for something project specific. You can select a specific product, or you can skip that, and you can put in exactly the information that you're looking for. So that goes and makes a conversation right on your Ace Lab account. Um, super easy to check back in on those. You can just head over to your library and go to conversations. 
All right, so that takes care of my kind of quick intro about ACE Lab, how to find today's speakers on ACE Lab and request information from them after the event. Um, we'll also be giving a quick poll uh, at the end of today's event to find out if anybody's interested in getting some follow-up info. Um, also, I know that today was an AIA approved event. Um, we did ask for that upon registration, but just in case anybody uh, didn't remember to put their AIA number or wants to make sure they gave it to us, I'm going to send out a form into the chat um, so you can share your AIA number with us here just to double check that we have everything. So I'll send that over right now. And I'll also send that over at the end of today's event um, just to make sure if anybody joined a few minutes late that they have that opportunity too. Um, we'll have a quick survey after the event as well. So that's super helpful if you can leave any comments or feedback for us on that survey. We really appreciate hearing from everyone um, their thoughts on these events and how they went. Um, and with that, I believe that takes care of all of my intro and housekeeping items. Um, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, we have Luke here. He's the founder and the CEO of Raydor. Um, he's going to be leading today's AIA approved presentation. And then we also have Dana from the team on um, who's going to be able to help out with any questions. So want to encourage folks to please submit questions to the Q&A during today's presentation. We will definitely try to get to all of those. If we don't get to your question, we'll have a record of it. So we'll be able to follow up with you after the event as well. All right, Luke, thank you so much. And uh, oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I love that overview of what you guys do. Um, you guys have been a really professional organization to work with. So I'm sure it's going really well for people using the tool. Um, I love how it looks, uh, how our, our page is looking there. So that's fantastic. Nice and inspiring way to start. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, there are some questions trickling in, I see. I can't actually reach out to you guys through this module, but I would encourage everyone to use the chat to just throw questions out there, either the Q&A or just chat. Maybe start off with how many cups of coffee you've had today and what state you're in or something like that would be interesting. Um, or mushroom. There's a bunch of different things now that, that, that people are using to stay focused. Um, I have some more things to talk to you about on how to stay focused and alert during the day, and that's part of the CU. So we're going to jump right in to designing flexible interiors. Uh, with sliding doors and movable walls and um, hopefully everyone can see the screen as it's intended so this is an aia presentation um, any questions is not an endorsement by aia but any questions about subject matter should be directed to me um, the person speaking on the topic today and uh, just a quick overview of my background um, my name is Luke Siegel. I'm from New York City. I started a company in New York City 23 years ago called Radar Inc specializes in, in making beautiful lightweight interior space dividing solutions with no floor track and many different customizable ways to uh, specify the product. And we can talk more about that if there's time, although I don't think there will be. There's a lot to cover today, but now you know that's my background. I've been just sliding doors, movable walls for the past 23 years, new technology on how to make that possible, specifically biased towards lightweight decorative, okay? So, uh, but we'll be talking about a range of topics so just in the background, uh, just so you can kind of know that like my background is a, is a sculptor, as a designer, myself an industrial designer. So I understand the uh, challenges you face in the marketplace when you're trying to you know, make more out of spaces, especially in a post-COVID world where you know, people are trying to reactivate. How do you make uh, the office more dynamic? How do you flex the floor plan to allow uh, uneven, unscripted type uses of the spaces? A lot of ways you can do that is with sliding doors and movable walls. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about how you can increase the uh, revenue generating power of spaces, you know, you know, in some in some environments like hospitality environments. We're also going to look at how spaces can be healthier for people. People can be more focused. Um, they're going to get um, well, we're going to dive into that in a minute, but it's about bringing more light into the spaces, having easy to operate systems that are ADA compliant and things like that. So just in general, I hope you have an overview by the end of today on how you can have more tools and more knowledge about how to approach designing a flexible interior. So let's jump right into the learning objectives. We have four. How do we boost health, safety, and wellness of interior spaces with these systems? From a functionality standpoint, what's the difference between a sliding door and an operable wall and all the gray zone in between, you know, um, and why does it matter? Uh, from a design standpoint, we're going to be looking at materials, hardware, best practices for installation, Again, bias towards overhead suspended. We are gonna talk about floor tracks, but we'll be looking at that. And from a budget standpoint, I'm gonna to try to pepper budget conversations throughout and especially rapid fire at the end. So we'll have an idea of starting off, 
um, with the different systems that divide spaces that are potential, what do they cost with all finishes and design being equal with aesthetics? Um, and then from that gradation of understanding how much flexibility will cost, then we'll start looking at materials and other choices that can affect budget. So what we're gonna be doing that all throughout. So jumping right into um, how can we make spaces healthier? You know, when I first started my company, it was all about creating privacy, but letting natural light fall into the space. And a lot of designers have an instinct that that's uh, either they love to design spaces that are light enriched, um, or they just know that they're um, inspiring. But there's a lot of studies that have shown that bringing more natural light deeper into the space is going to make people healthier. They're going to be more productive during the day. They're going to be more focused, more relaxed. Um, you know, in, in healing environments, they're going to experience less pain and have a shorter stay. So it's very powerful, bringing more natural light deeper into the space. And at the same time, if you're going to be more focused during the day and, and, um, and get more benefit during the day from having natural light, it, it works also to synchronize your circadian rhythm. So you're going to get a better sleep. And people sleep um, deeper, um, more rested, and, um, and and it's going to be uh, overall package of health when you have more exposure to daylight during the day. Um, specifically, uh, there's other health. There's health of our individual people in the space. There's health of the uh, the budget of the planet. Use less electricity if you bring in more light deeper into the space. As you can see right now, 15% of the energy used in the U.S. is to, is used to illuminate buildings. So there's a benefit there. LEED and the Well Building Standard both have language to support this as well. For LEED, it's Indoor Environmental Quality Criterion 8, is to provide building occupants with a connection between indoor space and the outdoor through the introduction of daylight and views into regularly occupied areas of the building. The Well Building Standard puts it a little more formally, I would say. Uh, it's a right to light for building occupants to support their circadian rhythm and reduce the building's dependency on electricity. So there's a lot of case to bring in light. There's always going to be a time when you want to block light. Um, from the standpoint of just in a, in, in a, home, a home, home office type environment, if you're trying to close office space and get some sleep, or if it's from a distraction standpoint, not wanting to see uh, you know, translucent shadows moving around for distractibility. So blocking light's important. Um, we'll talk about some of the different materials and glazing layers that you can use uh, for these systems. And I would just reiterate earlier, as I said, with acoustic privacy, it's a big question. You always need to know, are we dividing us? Are we trying to create a separation within a space that has an equal function, similar functions? Or are we trying to separate spaces to create uh, autonomous functions, uh, possibility functionality for autonomous use, right? This is going to be mostly focused on lightweight speech private systems, but we will talk about gaskets and seals and SDC ratings as we go. So let's jump right into systems. Uh, what's the difference between sliding door and an operable wall? So really, it's mostly about sliding doors tend to be for smaller openings, uh, more intuitive to operate. Um, operable walls tend to be combinations of panels that work in larger openings. In some cases, they are not combined or working together, like an example of the sliding stacking solution below, um, but they afford larger spans and uh, provide more flexibility. So we're going to jump into each one of these because uh, as you see, there's four animated GIFs on the page, and there's going to be more animation as we go along because that's fun and it helps you learn. Um, but you can see all four of these would be a great room divider. Like if you had two uh, symmetrically operating sliding doors that were six feet wide, you could do a 12 foot room divider, right? But you have to be able to fit a six foot panel in the space. You have to have wall space to slide that six foot panel in front of. Uh, and if you can do that, that's probably going to be a pretty affordable, simple, intuitive, high frequency operation space, uh, flex space. You know, if you don't have that, you can build a pocket. If you have room to build a pocket, if you don't have room to build a pocket, you might want those panels to slide and then pivot to the wall. And all the pricing built into those different systems is, um, you know, generally increasing as you increase uh, flexibility. So you're going to hear me a lot focus on the difference between access to the space and flexing the space. A lot of these systems provide access to the space. Some of them provide more flex than others. So let's jump right in. Starting with sliding doors, a simple track with one or two panels is a high frequency system. This is something that affords lots of access to the space. It also gives you lots of clearance. It's also pretty affordable. So when we talk about price, we're trying to say, I'm gonna give you an idea, for instance, of a three foot wide, eight foot tall, thin style and rail panel that has a laminate frame and a translucent glazing or an opal glazing 
or transparent glazing. Simple, okay, simple. This would be like 1500 a panel with all the hardware required with that simple laminate uh, and, and, um, and simple glazing system, right? So just to give you an idea, and there's a bubble on the right there that you can see is examples of uses. I'm not gonna read through them, but they're there to kind of inspire. Uh, and this is the first piece we're covering, which is sliding. Here's a little case study example of wall mount sliding door, barn door sliding. The big trend's been around for a while. It feels like 20 years now that barn doors have been hot. But they're really great in that they are um, simple to install and simple to specify. They, they can be wider than the opening, taller than the opening, um, and still be very successful uh, in the installation. Um, and that's something that's important to keep in mind. Um, little, just a little design tip. Always remember to delete the base molding and get the panel as close to the wall as possible, and maybe uh, make the overlap as wide as you can, as you can fit for the for the for the adjacent wall, for for sound and and, and light insulation. Um, here's another example of a sliding door with an ADA compliant pole. I'm going to pepper some ADA through here. 32 inches clear is the minimum. The, the also needs under five pounds of force to operate, and you have to be able to grab that that uh, handle with a easy to grab with a knuckle or an elbow. That's just a bit. So we're gonna continue to review ADA as we go. Um, here's an example of two wall mount sliding doors doing a great job of creating a room divider in this hotel suite. So you can be creative with a sliding door. It can be a very versatile tool. Well, now we're looking at sliding bypassing doors. Sliding bypassing doors are just like sliding doors, except there's two tracks. Uh, you can have two panels, three panels, seven panels. I'm showing two examples here. Uh, but the key is that it's a very simple from a mechanical standpoint. Um, two tracks, panels go back and forth within their own footprint. You never really get more than 50% clearance on this. It's one of my favorite uh, space dividing solutions because it's so, so simple, easy to operate, gives you high access to the space, lots of access to look at these multiple ways you get in and out of the space. Um, and um, it's great for high frequency operation. Um, it just doesn't give you a lot of um, full flexibility. So if full flexibility is really important to you, the sliding bypassing solution may not be um, ideal, but it's super affordable and leaves lots of room for some of the aesthetic things you may want to do. Here's an example. I've got perimeter office, natural daylight deeper into the corridors by using translucent division, using a sliding bypassing solution, uh, saving the planet and making people uh, feel better and sleep better. Uh, here's an example of another bypassing in a residential environment. Notice the uh, alternative stack in the middle. Panels are stacking in foot of the bed. So a lot of times people think it can only be stationary panels on the outside with doors that open from the middle. It's not true. So it's versatile. It's a great system. Sliding pocket doors. And again, I never change. We, oh, you know what? I didn't do this. I think I didn't even say it out loud. So when I was trying to give you a uniform idea of price, forgive me if I never said 1500 a panel. So yes, with the sliding doors, bypassing doors and now pocket doors. We're at this level of technology and, and, and hardware. We're at around 1500 a panel. Again, with a three by eight panel with a, a laminate frame, thin laminate frame and a basic glazing layer. Okay, 1500 a panel. And I want you to remember that because it's going to help you understand uh, what the costs are for some of the functionalities that we'll be covering. So we're still in the, in the very simple, straightforward sliding systems. So uh, this is a pocket door. Pocket doors, a uh, little extra cost if you have to, depending on how you're gonna build out that pocket, but from a mechanical standpoint, the system is a high traffic system. You can get full clearance, as you can see there, 100% or 90%, 95%, because sometimes you need that handle pull in the opening to be easy to grab with a knuckle or an elbow if you need it to be ADA compliant. So lots of access to the space. I have a design tip down there that I plan to go into detail when we cover it in the pocket wall section. It's only to say to make the pocket wider than the panel. I'll get specific about that later in the presentation. I'll show you why. Now this animation is there to remind me with the artwork on the wall to just, it's always a good idea to build a way into the pocket. You know, uh, whether it's a wainscoting or a, a large cabinet or some artwork that's hanging on the wall that could be removed. If something goes wrong in six months to five years, you know, the client will be happier that there's not a gorgeous wall covering that can't be uh, penetrated uh, to get into the pocket. So try to build your way, try to build an escape hatch into it because no matter who you're working with on a pocket system, it's inherently more complex to be coordinating that mechanism into the building. Um, the building, um, the trade, there's also another trade involved too. So there's a lot more complexity with building a pocket. Um, things can happen, usually happen in the pocket. So that's actually Murphy's law. 
Um, so here's an example of a pocket door in a recessed install. Now we're moving to sliding walls. So sliding walls are like sliding bypassing solutions. There's just more tracks involved and the panels are actually connected with telescoping hardware. So um, you're gonna have some questions in a minute about how you deal with no floor track on this. I'm gonna show you that in a moment. And again, at the hardware section, but this is a very intuitive to operate, simple to install, fairly simple to install, high traffic access, medium to high traffic. You see, I write medium to high traffic. And the reason for that is, the assumption is that you're going to get access through the green arrow, right? The lead door. Yeah, you're going to get access to the space more often than you're going to flex the space. So what am I talking about? Well, you might have access every five seconds through that lead door, and you might have uh, you might flex the space two to four times a day for conferences or um, just changing up the floor plan. It's usually not as often as the lead door is operated. So there's also alternative ways to get in and out of the space with a sliding wall. And there are flush bolts and a potential for using a single floor track that I can um, get into more detail as we cover that in the hardware section. But right now, have a look at this animation. Four panels all gathering up, no floor track, sliding back and forth in the opening. Now, um, in a commercial environment, you might have some restriction on how much travel this wall could do because you might want to put a guide fin in the overlap of the trailing panel in order to keep it from having any sway. But that example a moment ago is totally possible and flush bolts are what you would use to anchor the panels in different combinations. Here's an example of a six panel symmetrical sliding wall. And you know, notice how the stacking can be from the outside to the inside. Think of how you can print multiple floor plans for your client and show them ideas of how the single uh, space that they have could be divided into two. It could be opened into one, but they can also be used in different ways. If you can imagine using movable furniture to reimagine how people would flow through this space with these different stacking positions. And sometimes with the stacking walls that we're gonna cover, you don't always have to have all the panels parked or all the panels out. We'll talk about that. Here's another example of a sliding wall. Sliding walls have a lot of tracks if you have a lot of panels. So take a look at the top there. You can see they did a pretty good job of building that soffit in, making it look architecturally uh, resonant. Um, but there's a lot of tracks and there's a stagger. So keep that in mind when designing with a sliding wall. Sliding wing walls are just like sliding walls. Um, they just slide in front of the adjacent wall. So there's a little more track. What's really great about this is you have that full clearance. This is the most affordable, simple to operate, fully clear flex space system we're gonna look at. Um, really easy to operate again, and uh, more affordable, simple stacks right in front of the wall. So sliding walls, and, I, and forgive me if I failed to mention it when I first described again that we were going to talk about numbers. We started off with 1500 a panel for, for sliding and the sliding walls are 2000 a panel, just to give you that benchmark, right? 2000 a panel because there's increased track, there's increased hardware, there's mechanisms at the bottom for telescoping hardware and things like that. So it's a slight tick up, okay? 2000 a panel. So this would be an $8,000 wall. Here's an example of the animation. So, you know, you're paying a little more for this mechanism. You're paying a little more for the flexibility that you're getting from this. Here's an example of one in a Starbucks. These are five foot by 10 foot, actually. Nice, nice size panel there with a lock at the far side for security. Okay, so sliding walls can also disappear into a pocket. This is called the sliding pocket wall. Same system, still at 2000 a panel panels would slide into the pocket and disappear. It's magical, it's beautiful, um, gives you lots of high traffic access and you can fully flex the space, which is amazing, provided you have room to build that pocket, right? So if you have room to build that pocket, it can be magical, panels can completely disappear. It's really cool. Um, and you can see there, I'm saying to build the pocket two inches wider than the width of the panel, deeper than the width of the panel, for reasons that I will just show you uh, in a moment. So you can see this four panel system, is sliding and collecting and disappearing into the wall. And when it comes out of the wall, it's going to have a little fin at the trailing panel that closes the gap made by the others, which we call a pocket concealment panel. And I'll show you that again, a pocket concealment panel closes the gap made by the other panels. What does that look like inside the pocket? Zooming into the pocket, you can see that this piece here is a piece of prime three quarter inch MDF that's pre-drilled and mounted to the back of the trailing panel. And this is really great because it allows for a full extension of the system. You don't have to try to engineer the rear style of the trailing door to be a little wider or whatever. Uh, and this allows all the panels to come out completely and cleanly close off the pocket. It's just a recommendation. And there's a few other things in the pocket that 
that are part of why we say spec it two inches wider than the panel. We can talk more detail on that if we have time, you can reach out. Um, please write questions in the chat if you have them. Um, all right, so this is an example of a sliding pocket wall with an ADA compliant pole. Again, ADA complying isn't just with that handle, easy to grab. It also has to be under five pounds of force to move. And it's also nice that the floor is smooth, nothing in the way, and we're definitely over 32 inches clear here. So here's an example of a sliding pocket wall. And this really speaks to what I was saying earlier about maximizing the revenue generating power of a space. Look at this again, two pocket walls and one, can anyone spot the stationary pivot door? Let's do it again. So on the right was a four panel pocket wall that disappears and opens up the bar. And on the left is a three panel pocket wall that leaves a stationary pivot door there for functional reasons likely in this design, but it can also be a great way to help you meet a uh, fire exit code compliance and things like that. Po pivot stationary pivot doors are easily specified in all of the systems we're covering here today. Uh, this is just kind of the first example of me showing that to you. But you notice here, I'm going to go back at 1130. This place is charming with five tops by the window. So the lunch hour can start early. Once they get busy, they can open it up. Or if they're trying to entertain a party at the back left, they can do that. Or if the bar gets loud, they can close that. They have options. They can play the restaurant like an instrument. So think about how movable walls can really activate and open up and create multiple floor plan functional uses for the space for your clients. So now we're moving to sliding stacking doors. Sliding stacking doors are kind of more firmly in the operable wall camp. Uh, and, and as we said earlier, straight sliding, simple 1500 a panel, sliding walls, little more hardware, telescoping, larger openings, 2,000 a panel. Now, sliding stacking systems um, are 3,000 a panel with, again, laminate frame, basic glazing, three by eight panel. And the reason why it's so much more is, um, is because there's a lot more sophistication in the hardware and the operation of these systems. And you'll also notice that I'm writing low to high traffic. The reason for that is, while you notice that there is a pivot door at the bottom there, that is a high traffic access point that no one needs to know how to use, right? If you're looking at that, you know, oh, I'll walk through that door. The other, system, the other panels may need some instruction. So uh, it's not as intuitive to operate these walls. But what's really powerful about them is you can do very large openings. You can actually have them turn corners multiple times and create entire rooms that disappear. Uh, and what's so um, architecturally significant, I think, is also that the panels, no matter how many you have, when they come off their stacking area, they read as one track. So they all butt up against each other. There's no overlaps. And that really looks much more like a wall than some of the other systems we've been looking at. So here's an example of a sliding system, sliding stacking system that completely gives you full flexibility, completely out of the space. And in this case, from the rendering, you probably need another way in and out of this space, as we'll cover later when we talk about codes. Basically, sliding, straight sliding cannot be the only way in and out of the space in many cases. Um, there are some exceptions, but Anyway, here's an example of a pivot door being specified into this system. So the pivot door is the high traffic access point and the other three panels need to be operated by someone. And this does not mean a one week seminar on how to operate the panels. It just means that if the expectation is that anyone should be able to flex this wall, then you might want to use a sliding wall. Um, if someone is designated to be the one to flex the space, someone who works at the space or lives at the space, you know, they just need to be shown how to do it. It takes 20 minutes, you know, lift a flush bolt, move the panels like this. But it's just something to consider when you're designing uh, who is going to be the one to flex the space. So here's a nice shot of um, a sliding stacking parallel to the opening with a pivot door at the back right. You see that pivot door opens up and all the panels slide out. And then they turn 90 degrees in a surface mounted installation. Uh, this is nice. No floor track. You can imagine how you can have some of the panels in the opening in different positions, flush bolted down in different positions with movable furniture, you could probably print, if you get creative, three, four, five different floor plan layouts for your clients to use with this type of system in terms of not just simply being room, no room, but more like, you know, using, using, uh, using strategic panel locations to help people create private nooks or to use the space in more creative ways. Um, so use your imagination. Um, so here's another uh, example of a sliding stacking um, parallel. You can see a close-up of the flush bolt, which helps create stability for the system. So here's another version of the sliding stacking system. This is a perpendicular stack. So there's a little more involved here. 
As I said earlier, we're still at 3,000 a panel for this type of system. And the parking area, just like I said earlier about the pocket system, you know, you have to factor in the cost of building the pocket. For the sliding perpendicular system, you might have to factor a little extra blocking for the stacking area. So you see this dotted line shows that the actual, that's where um, panels will be supported. So there's load off the span with the sliding stacking perpendicular. So you, you're gonna make sure that there's some structure and support there to support that. Depending on the weight of your system, that can be an issue or not. Um, for lightweight systems, we'll cover weight in a moment, but still low to high traffic. Um, and one thing I wanna point out about this solution, um, while I said this system works great for very large spans as well as small spans, I wanna emphasize that it works for small spans. The example on the bottom left, um, would be ideal if you had a specification where you really wanted to have high access to the space through the pivot door, but you also wanted to create full flexibility and you had no room to slide the panels in front of an adjacent wall, which could have been keeping your costs down using a sliding wing wall, and you have no room to build a pocket. So um, if you have no room to build a pocket, you have no adjacent room on the wall, this type of system um, would really save you even in a very small space, right? Because the panels are going to slide and stack within the opening span and give you a maximum amount of clearance. So consider that. And here's an animation of that example. Pivot door opens and all the panels slide and stack on top of it. OK, here's a real world example. Nice thin style and rail walnut door. Nice carpeting, lots of soft surfaces and materials for acoustics. And a, an applied film, it looks like. We'll be getting to that topic in a minute. But I really want you to focus on uh, the sliding stacking on the top left. You can see that stacking area is flush to the ceiling. That's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a more costly way to do the installation. It's, it's beautiful. It's clean. It's buried in the ceiling, so it needed to be framed in. We'll be covering that uh, a little more in a moment. But notice that that's probably what I was trying to say earlier. That's probably where you have to think about a little bit of extra blocking and structural support. Okay, and folding doors. We used to cover uh, center folding, uh, but in the constraint of time, I just cover end folding because a lot of specifications have gone, uh, start out life as a center fold system and end up as a stacking system. So I like to cover uh, the end fold system because it's kind of unique. Um, all the weight, uh, all the support is happening at the end of the panel. You can see there's a single track in the opening. These three examples uh, all work with no floor track. If you wanted to do a fifth panel in the run, you probably have to do a floor guide. Um, so this is a, a, a very intuitive to operate system. As you can see, there's a high traffic pivot access panel at the example in the middle. Um, and, um, and what's nice is it's sliding and stacking within the span, similarly to what I just showed you a moment ago with the sliding stacking solution. This isn't going to save any money though in our little experiment around laminate frame and um, basic glazing with a three by eight panel, this is still around 3000 a panel. And in part because of the robust hardware required for this operate, as well as the hinges, which is not present with the other ones, kind of adds to the cost. But uh, one thing I haven't talked a lot about is panel uh, restrictions on width. For a lot of the systems we've been looking at, there's no real uh, restriction on the height and the width. It has to do with, can you fit the panel in the space? Do you have the structural support? Are the carriers able to you know, carry the system. In my experience, folding systems um, are a little more sensitive to panel size. Uh, narrower is better, uh, no matter who's making it. Uh, there's a cantilevered truth to the way these systems work. So, um, so the narrower the system, less stress on the hardware. So in my uh, view, we can do six foot wide sliding doors, five foot wide sliding doors. With end folding doors, I recommend a three foot max as a, as a sort of rule of thumb to not go wider than three feet. There are certainly some systems that can do wider. Uh, that's just my guide to you um, that, that um, I, I believe that that's good advice. Okay, so um, here's an example of end folding solution animation. And just a quick photo of a, of a storage application of, of this system. So um, this, this moment here, just a great way to pull over the side of the road and just kind of do a check run through of some things we've talked about and some things we have yet to talk about. Uh, we talked about daylight. Can we bring daylight into the space and make the space healthier for people? Um, what level of visual privacy would be permitted? These transparent, translucent films. There's a lot of things we're about to cover. Um, acoustic privacy is a big conversation. As I said earlier, you know, is this an autonomous function we're, we're closing off for? Or is there going to be uh, an equal amount of chatter and noise going on in the space where we're trying to create a focused environment and a lightweight system would do? Very important to figure that out in early on. 
Um, functionality, what's going to be the best functionality for the space? Uh, pivot door in, sliding to the right. Um, just how do you want the panels to move in a way that will work best for the flow of the space? And what's the frequency of use, uh, the expected traffic? How often will you need access to the space in and out of the room versus how often will you need to flex the space? You know, completely put the panels out of the way, put the chairs out, move the tables around. You know, flexing the space is not usually the same frequency requirement as access to the space. Um, will there be someone at the space who's operating the panels? If there are, you have a few more options as we discussed. Um, new build versus retrofit, we haven't really talked too much about. We will in a moment. Door clearance, uh, this is a function of, it can be a function of code or function, right? Um, 32 inches clear for ADA, but you might want 32 feet for what it is you're trying to achieve in the space. Uh, floor threshold, in this photo, you can see there's no floor threshold. No floor threshold is a very creative way to create a flex space. You really want to empower people to reimagine the space. Well, don't have a floor track there, no floor transition. You know, that's a real great way to move panels out of the way and reimagine the space in a totally new way. Sometimes you do need a floor threshold. Times where you might need that is in a retrofit example where there's a wonky floor and you're going to have to create somewhat of a slope threshold in order to allow for the panels to work properly and to be uh, level and you can't level the entire floor. There can be floor transition moments. Just think about, do you need a floor threshold? It's on the checklist. Required egress, uh, this is more on the code level. Uh, as we've talked about it, you can always specify a stationary pivot door, which can help, not always solve, but can help um, for your egress requirements. And on a budget, we've been talking budget, and we will talk more budget as we go through, recapping some things and talking about some new things in a moment. Um, material and design choices. Let's cover uh, first mounting options, then floor guides, bolts and tracks, material choice and hardware and code compliance. There are three main ways to install straight sliding solutions. This goes for the sliding, the, the sliding walls and such um, that you saw in the bypassing. So uh, surface mounted, flush and recessed. Recessed is where the panels are actually higher than the ceiling or soffit line. The panels go up and into the header, right? Uh, flush is where the track is flush to the bottom of the, of the, of the ceiling or the soffit. Um, it's the cleanest looking and most challenging to, to execute. Uh, surface mounted is very typically done in retrofits, um, usually the most cost effective way. Um, and um, just quickly, a couple of examples. On the left, you can see a track is buried into the ceiling that has got to be either a gut renovation or new construction in order to allow. It's rare that you can channel into the existing ceiling and have a successful flush install without rebuilding the ceiling. Just keep that in mind. It's also really tricky when you've got floor to ceiling panels, floor to continuous ceiling panels for measurement and and I'll go over that again in a minute. In the middle example is probably a retrofit example in a soffit where the panels are flush installed into the soffit uh, with the tracks, sorry. Uh, and on the right is an example of a wall mount slider with the fascia and the blocking flush to the bottom of the track. Um, in this example, and this kind of speaks to the costs we were talking earlier, because uh, you can see here the straight sliding mechanisms, a very simple channel with wheel trolleys. Uh, now we're looking at the stacking and the folding uh, and the ways that they get hung. Notice they're much more complex. Uh, don't want to distract us here. We are talking about how they in get installed, but uh, we can come back to that. Notice there's only two here. I only show surface mounted and flush mounted. And the reason for that, for folding and for stacking, is because if you had the panels recessed above the ceiling line, above the soffit line, you would have to channel the ceiling out of the way for the movement of the panel outside the plane, right? So let's keep it simple. We like to recommend flush install whenever you can and, and budget will allow, although surface install can be beautiful too if it's done cleanly. Uh, the example on the bottom is just showing a fascia over a wall mount slider or not. Um, on the right, I wanna just highlight again, multi-panel sliding wall, Flush track to a continuous ceiling is tricky to do. It's important to design this and stay connected to the project team. The general contractor, floor sub, and framers all need to be on the same page that this is a critical opening and ceilings very often are not level enough to terminate into the side with a J-bead into the aluminum and have it look nice. So that really does need everyone to be on board, really keep everyone paying attention. Like a contrast, as I said at the beginning of our talk, with wall mount sliding where it's, you know, there's a lot of room for forgiveness on a wall mount sliding door. There's not with continuous to the ceiling flush installation with tracks. The example on the left, 
flush install in a soffit, a little more room to play there with a soffit. And on the bottom example is a surface mounted install. Uh, in this photo on the right, we have a recessed sliding pocket wall up and into the ceiling. In the middle, we have a surface mounted bypassing solution. And on the left, kind of a rule breaker there, but I wanted to show you an example of a recessed install of a sliding stacking parallel. With a parallel stack, it's not that big a deal, but you can see how they cut the soffit out of the way in order for the panels to actually stack and park in their position under there. So it's kind of wonky looking, but obviously a very beautiful install. Okay, so this is kind of what I was saying earlier about what bring what makes these things expensive or not. You know, uh, first of all, the straight simple sliding and bypassing pocket systems, um, they really have just a T guide or something simple on the floor that keeps the panels in check. Um, the sliding walls have more, they have more straight track, they have the telescoping hardware, that's part of why they have um, that up that increase in cost to $500 a panel that I was giving you as a ballpark example. If you look at sliding stacking and, and, and the end folding, there's not a lot on the floor that would indicate uh, or describe why they're more expensive. And that's why I'll pop us back to this slide and just show you these trolleys and mechanisms are heavier gauge, more precision, more sophisticated, higher quality materials and more wheels and a lot of things going on there in order to allow the panels to move the way they do for those, those functions for sliding stacking and, and folding end. Uh, this slide here just really showcases uh, a six panel sliding wall that's tethered to the ground with a flush bolt on the trailing panel, which creates stability for the entire system. Um, you could install a gray guide, which is typical for the sliding doors and the bypassing in a sliding wall to create the stability in place of or in conjunction with the flush bolts uh, for a sliding wall. Um, certainly you can do that. Uh, upper left is just a U channel usually used on rustic barn door type applications. Let me spend more time on this slide. So this slide is uh, talking about floor tracks. On the left is an example of a floor guide. A floor guide is something that can be used in any of the systems we've covered, even the ones that turn corners. A floor guide can create lateral stability for a very wide sliding door or a door that's getting uh, work done to it or performance like a dry erase or a push pin on it. You wanna move it around and you want a little more stability. Uh, so all the load is on the sidewalls. This is an added level of complexity and cost. Yes, the floor has to be very level. Yes, it still can be a trip hazard, but a single floor guide can be really helpful for a very, like I said, very wide door and some of those other examples, as well as a multi-panel system where you're trying to create stability uh, in one panel to create stability for the entire assemblage of panels. So that can be great. And again, it's an added cost because all the weight and load is supported overhead. And this is just providing some stability on the ground. Now on the right side example is a floor rolling solution. All the weight and load is on the floor as well as the guiding. Uh, overhead is usually a lightweight soffit or header. Um, that is a way you can save some cost, but keep in mind the, the floor rolling system is very sensitive to uh, level installation. And also it only works for straight sliding and every panel that is sliding needs one. So if you have five panels, you'll have five tracks on the floor. You know, there is an application for that a time and a place. I just think in general, it is a, a higher level of potential for failure in that dirt and debris more easily falls on the floor track and gets clogged and and, and messes around with that. So, you know, whenever possible, try to specify um, overhead suspended with guide with simple guides that don't actually um, penetrate the floor if you can avoid it. So now let's let's look at some material stuff: uh, frames, insert, patterning, and hardware. So we're looking at a beautiful example of a polycarbonate and a custom stain match frame. Um, as I was talking to you earlier about price, I was talking about the top row here, right? Laminate frames, simple more cost-effective laminate frames, HPL or low pressure laminate or vinyl laminate type frame for cost. And with glazing, I was speaking more about the right, the left side here, transparent, translucent, opal, simple things is what, what created um, my pricing examples for you. Okay, but if you wanted to use real wood veneer or you want to use real wood or stain match or paint match, you can expect that to add 20 to 40% to the cost of the system cost. Um, with respect to glazing, glazing is kind of um, a wild card. You can spend anywhere from 100 to 200% more, um, whether it's uh, eco resin encapsulated uh, veneer or botanicals inside polycarbonate, or whether it's a decorative laminated glass. You know, this is the area that can really run away with you. You can have a $10,000 bypassing wall that becomes 
a twenty twenty five thousand dollar bypassing wall just by specifying a gorgeous example of some glazing. Now, if you don't actually have um, um, if you don't want to add that to your budget, or if that's another another team's budget, the interiors team's budget, you can always specify clear and a film can be applied later, like a cloaking film, which can be an affordable solution on top of clear, uh, clear glass or clear acrylic. Um, and here's an example of uh, another film, a polarizing film, which allows you to target where the privacy is. It allows you to see directly into the space, but not peripherally, no matter where you're standing. You can also specify it to let you see peripherally, but not directly. And you know what I mean, back and forth. It can also be oriented horizontally or vertically. This is not a cost saver, but it can be applied to glass after the fact. Another one that's not a cost saver that's kind of popular for people is switch glass. Switch glass allows you to flip a switch and you can see through. I think it would be a lot more popular and more successful in general if uh, it did not require power to see through. It does. So if more often than not, you want the, the it to be private, it might be a good solution. And it's also expensive and it can burn out if it's left on all the time. Uh, a, a more affordable uh, design uh, feature that I'd like to talk about is muntins. Muntins can be structural, they can be decorative, they can be both. The example on the right is a cross brace in a barn door, which is also the handle to get out of this, bar, this bathroom sliding door. Uh, this is an example of more of a environmental graphic kaleidoscopic pattern, creating an, uh, kind of a beautiful with light and shadow. This is 20 to 40% more than system cost. So it's much less money than playing around with glazing in your budget. Um, hardware. So these are examples of some ADA compliant poles, which are easy to grab with a knuckle or an elbow. A lot of um, these systems are gonna uh, require or come with a flush pull, something that's not ADA compliant, but it indicates which panel to slide, which panel to pull, to, to pivot, to fold. Uh, it's a pretty ubiquitous piece of hardware. Another one that's very common for straight sliding solutions is the thumb turn lock, recessed thumb turn lock with coin release. <clears throat> you can also specify this in ADA compliant with an easy to grab uh, lever with a knuckle or an elbow again. Another lock that's a good one from a standpoint when you have no place to strike to is a jam lock. It works well for sliding pocket systems or wall mount sliding doors. A jam lock functions like this. And it's an example also of an ADA compliant jam lock if you can trigger it with a knuckle or an elbow. So um, quick note on compliance. We're running close to our, our limit of time here, but I want to talk about these three topics. Each of them could be a complete presentation onto themselves, but let's just cover it. STC rating, sound transmission class. As I said at the top of this uh, conversation today, um, most of what you're looking at is speech private systems systems that have a sound transmission class rating of 15 to 25 STC, which allows you to kind of know someone's in the next door having, you can hear muffled speech uh, next door. And that's something that um, um, usually lightweight systems afford more aesthetic options, um, easier to operate. If you need a higher level of STC um, sound, sound insulation for an autonomous function, likely it'll be heavier panels less aesthetic options, more vertical seals and top and bottom seals. Sometimes the panels are less intuitive to operate and need an operator. Uh, that's just a back of the napkin on it because um, we don't have a ton of time to talk about that topic per, per se. Here's another uh, snippet on ADA. We mentioned throughout the chat, 32 inches minimum clearance. You have to be able to easily grab the pole with a knuckle or an elbow, and it has to be under five pounds of force to operate. Now you can have a floor track in this opening, but it has to be flush to the floor, or if there's a slope on a surface mounted install, it has to have a two to one slope in order for a wheelchair to roll over it. Um, um, lastly, from a code compliance standpoint, egress. Now, um, pretty much all the states uh, have, they have some nuance, uh, unique nuance codes on this, but for in general, lots of applications do not permit that you have straight sliding solution be the only way in and out of a space. One of the exceptions is prison, so it really doesn't come up that often. So you're probably going to need to have, um, depending on what you're, where you're designing, but you're going to need to have a pivot door sometimes, and I just want you to take away that you can specify a stationary pivot door with any of the solutions we've covered today. So now running into the home stretch here, uh, my top six important budget considerations. Most of this is a kind of a reiteration of things we've already talked about that really affect budget. So let's jump right in. System choice, panel design, track install, soffit construction, weight and structure and installation. Uh, this is just gonna go rapid fire. So from a systems choice standpoint, flexibility versus access. With the same type of opening, if you want a lot of access to the space, there are many systems very affordable, like the one atop. 
If you want a lot of clearance and access, sometimes you're going to spend two to three times the cost for that. So really decide how much flexibility do I need versus access to the space. Another consideration is the panel. As I was saying, you can go nuts here. You know, if you have a simple, uh, very basic finishes that you're really trying to focus on the architectural fluidity of the flex space is more important than the aesthetics. That's important to know because you can easily double or triple the budget with some aesthetic things like custom frames and custom glazing layers with art or what have you really got to know because if you know the priority is to do something magical and beautiful and you don't have a huge budget then you might want to think about a more simple operative type system to save money on the system side of things so which is the tail which is the dog is very important to figure out um budget consideration around track install so this simply is um this simply is um the difference between flush install and surface mount uh, they tend to be much more affordable when it's surface mount. Now, panel uh, versus ceiling at soffit construction. So a lot of times this gets overlooked. You have to just know what's going on above the panels, uh, the support and the structure. You know, on the example on the bottom left, those are maple panels, nine foot six tall in a 10 foot opening, simple plywood nailer. The other examples show a lot more going on. On the right, there's a glass transom at top. There's probably five to six feet of sheetrock and blocking that are all navigating HVAC and plumbing and things. So is that in your budget or not? That's a question to ask yourself. Another consideration is weight, heavy versus light. Lightweight systems, usually speech private systems, easier to operate and easier to mount to the existing blocking. Sometimes heavier duty acoustic systems or exterior systems are going to require, or glass and metal, uh, are going to require um, more support. And they might need an architect, you might need a, uh, sorry, an engineer to stamp the drawing, they might specify I-beam or steel. So just keep in mind, what is the weight? Um, I guess the last one is um, installation, simplicity versus complex. There are times where you need a sliding stacking, uh, half inch glass system that turns 90 degrees and locks to the floor. It's gonna be a more expensive system. And there's going to be fewer people to sell it, fewer people to install it, fewer people who will know how to operate it. It's complex, um, but there is, is a time and a place for it. The system above is a sliding bypassing solution. Easy to specify, easy to install, easy to service, easy to operate. So try to keep things simple whenever possible. Boy, I, I, am, I ran crazy here. So this is like my second to last slide. We only have a few minutes left. I hope I can look at some questions, but I hope you learned something today uh, that you can take to your next project thinking about how you're going to approach designing a flexible interior through materials, construction, um, best practices around bringing light deeper into spaces. Um, so I hope I added some value to you here today. And if you have some questions, I'm gonna to try to scan that. And I invite Bo or Dana to come in and, uh, and maybe rein me in and have me look at some things that need attention. Um, but I really appreciate uh, the time spent with you guys today. Let me have a look at some of what your questions are. Thank you so much, Luke. That was a great uh, presentation. And yeah, really breezed through that and got a lot of information in, in uh, those 50 minutes. So great job. Really appreciate that. Um, all right. So we have our poll launch just in case anybody didn't see. If you'd like follow up information, please just uh, let us know during that poll. That'll make sure we know that uh, we should follow up with you after today's event. Um, other than that, quiz quick housekeeping item. I also sent a link into the chat to sign up for next week's webinar. And I'm going to send over that link to the um, AIA sign in form again, just in case anybody missed that in the beginning and wants to ensure that we have their AIA number. Um, all right, so let's jump into some of these questions with the last few moments we have left. Yes. And I think, you know, sometimes the questions at the end, we should start at the end, because sometimes that they ask in the middle, there might have been something that was answered. So let me just for look. Sure. Thanks for that, Tracy. I uh, appreciate that. Um, I'm going to let IDCEC, you, you kind of handle that. We, mm -hmm. To be honest, this is also approved from IDCEC. Um, okay. Let's see here. Cost increase 10 foot versus 8 foot. That is absolutely a threshold. Sure. Jumping above 8 feet, you start running into different raw material lengths. So you're just cutting it out of more raw materials. I think, um, um, but it's still negligible in terms of the larger picture of cost jumping from eight foot to a 10 foot template or in other manufacturers that can go up to 12 feet. You know, I can't answer for that, but I would say that you're definitely in, um, you know, a 10 to 20% increase in cost. It's not going to be a massive change. Um, let's see, do different mounting options affect STC recess for surface mount? Great question, Joy. Uh, yes, uh, recessed install can be more private. 
uh, than, for instance, a surface mounted installation. But it really has more to do because sometimes the, the panels, if they're really high and up and into the header or into the continuous ceiling, and you can absolutely increase the privacy. Um, um, gaskets and seals are your best bet and also focusing on the materials. It's really important to figure out, are we trying to divide the space for an autonomous function? Because a lot of times lightweight division does a great job of creating focused environments for privacy, for conference, for an office, especially if there's a lot of ambient noise in the common space. People don't talk about that a lot. It's usually called noise masking, but lightweight systems work really well in those cases. And even really high rated STC systems don't work as well if that hasn't been thought through. That's kind of a separate conversation. I'd love to dive in sometime. We should talk about some of the different things like noise ballasting, noise masking, and different ways that you can have a lightweight, highly aesthetic system give you the kind of privacy that you want. But in general, uh, yeah. I would say if you did a recessed installation with panels high and up and in the, hot, the header or the soffit, that would help from a sound standpoint. Um, let's see, is there a download PDF to this webinar? We'll have to, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so we will post a recording of today's webinar on ACE Lab. Um, so you'll be able to access that on ACE Lab. Um, super easy to find that. We'll, we can send over a link to anybody who asked that question. Cool. Thank you, Bo. Uh, Shoku is asking, please touch on product warranty. Thank you. Well, I guess we haven't talked too much about Radar. I guess this is probably the time to talk about Radar. So Radar does um, create, kind of coordinates bringing um, the beautiful millwork aesthetic, uh, some of the stuff you've seen like in this presentation with beautiful sliding lightweight division, um, all the materials, customization, all of that, as well as all the hardware, we have it all in CAD and Revit as well. So we have a fully warrantied turnkey solution that we provide. We make it in USA, in New York actually, and we ship it all over the country. And our lead times are anywhere from um, five weeks to 10 weeks, depending on the finishes that you select. But, um, and yes, we are warrantied. So our standard warranty is a one-year warranty. That said, Radar has been, a 20, been in business 23 years. And um, we often work with, with um, designers or rather, uh, developers who have specific requests for warranties. So depending on the system and configuration, we can increase warranties up to three to five years. Um, Carl, I'm glad you mentioned ADA. That was earlier, Carl. I hope I got to what you needed on that. We did talk some ADA today. Um, let's see, Le Leah is asking, can you speak about the concern of floor penetrations adversely affecting the ICC acoustics? of the floor assembly. What affects it, number or depth? Is there a way to manage this concern? I don't know how to answer that one, Leah. I love that, I've never heard that one before. I think what you're asking has to do with, um, you know, if you're gonna put a floor guide in the floor, does that affect the acoustics of the room? If, is that your question? Can you elaborate on that a little? And meanwhile, I'm gonna jump to David's question. With no floor tracks, what keeps the panel, panels vertical? There may be more air motion on one side. That's a great point. David, and the answer is flush bolts. Flush bolts are, let me see if I can, I can switch up the share here. I think I've got some stuff I can show. Boom, let's do this. Um, so a flush bolts can be a great way to uh, anchor and stabilize the panels. Uh, flush bolts that come out, the bolt would go into this strike and create stability for one and sometimes the entire uh, group of systems. Um, so that's, that's an example of how you create um, more um, stability. And also when it comes to examples of like um, the telescoping hardware, the telescoping hardware can also create inertia, keeps all the panels together. So if you anchor one panel uh, with either flush bolt or a floor or a continuous floor track or a floor guide, uh, the other panels are gonna be tethered to each other and that keeps them from swaying. I hope that helps answer that. While I look at some of those, I'm going to show some examples of some of the systems that we saw that are, in fact, radar systems. Let me see here. Back to the Q&A. So in this example we're looking at here, each of these panels has a floor, a floor bolt that goes into the floor. And that's not something that you have to do. Um, in that way, you can handle that a few different ways. Let me try to show you an example of what I'm saying. Like for instance, um, on our uh, website, if you were to go to, let's say, 
uh, a sliding pocket wall, for example, let's say the pocket wall, and you were to click into it, it would take you to uh, the pocket wall section where you'd have your downloads uh, of the different types of configurations. You could look at uh, some examples of different pocket walls, of course, but I'm trying to take you down here, frames, inserts, just a couple of examples. We work with Freeform and LumaCore as well, if you want to spec that kind of thing. Patterns, those are the kind of Munton patterns. And the hardware, let me jump right into hardware. So this is where you would go to specify something like an ADA pole or a lock if you wanted to. But I wanted to show you this. The flush bolts are our standard way of handling stability, but the floor strike lock is also another way. So the, this is a thumb turn at 36 inches that strikes to the floor the same way a floor flush bolt does. That's an upgrade that you can do. So in a lot of ways, what we're talking about, like when I mentioned pricing, you know, flush bolts are included in the pricing. When I was giving ballpark pricing, that is sort of emblematic of what radars cost in their examples, for example, with basic finishes, but all the hardware is included. So, you know, as an example in this, uh, we're still looking at this. Let me go back up and show you a download. If we grabbed a three panel pocket wall and just downloaded one with soft close, this would just show you quickly the kind of detail that comes with it when I'm saying, for instance, pocket wall started 2000 a panel. This is everything that comes with it, right? Tracks, trolleys, low profile carriers machined into the top of the panel, telescoping hardware, uh, flush bolts, uh, edge pull, uh, pocket concealment panel, all the pocket kit, all that stuff. So, you know, we, we want to be that, that turnkey solution for you. Uh, where you can find everything that you need. Um, um, right. So stop share. So uh, let me go back to these questions. Let's see. I think we're actually at time. Um, okay. Or time. So okay. Um, yeah, we can go ahead and wrap up for today. You got to play the music. You know, we got to get the same. I know, a little yeah. ding. <laughs> well, we had some folks stick on for a minute. So Kane, I come along and start pulling me out. Uh, out with us and um, appreciate everyone who put in so many questions. We've definitely got some stuff to follow up on. Um, but yeah, just want to thank everyone so much for coming out today and for hanging on for a few extra minutes to get to see some of those great examples of Radar's products. It was really great that we had time to do that. I'd love um, to be able to um, continue with Leah. I don't know how that works, Bo, but uh, I leave it in your hands. She has some more back and forth on that. I wouldn't totally. want to leave her hanging. So totally. we'll make me. sure to uh, get you Leah's information so that you guys can okay. be in touch and connect about those questions. Okay. And anyone else who had unanswered questions as well, we'll make sure that Radar has all of those inquiries. Um, okay, great. Thank you so much, Luke. Thank you, Dana. Really yeah. appreciate it. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of your Thursday, everyone. Thank you, Bo. All right. Hey, everyone. Bye.